is no universe in which these books needed to have been written, and yet here we are. Boy, am I glad to live in the timeline with these books, because they're a hot mess. Hey, Amelia. <coughs> I'm a little sicky right now, once again. I just finished reading the last two books of the selection series. I'm so, so angry. Kira Cass has turned me into a hater. Technically, The Heir and The Crown are books four and five of the selection series. I choose to believe that the selection is just the first three books and these other two are just like a weird freak accident that happened later that we don't really talk about. Book one, The Heir. So this takes place like 20 years in the future. Maxon is king, America is queen. They have four kids. You thought the name America Singer was bad? You're not even ready for these names. From oldest to youngest, we have Edlin Shreve. Edlin. Edlin. Edlin this ass. Edlin. It's not even fun to say. I think Renesme is better, honestly. If I was ranking terrible book names, I mean, it's close, but I think Edlin is worse. Renesme, you can at least pretend it's a real name. Renesme. Like, if you say it really quickly and you don't think about it too hard, like, it sounds like normal. Edlin? Also, guess what Edlin means? It means princess. That's her name, Princess Princess, because she's the princess. And then she becomes the queen and she's Queen Princess. It is so unhinged. Edlin's brother is Aaron. Oh, that's a normal name, Ainsley. No, you're wrong. Aaron, no, boring. A-H-R-E-N, Aaron. Edlin and Aaron are twins. Then we have Caden. It's a pretty normal name. It's spelled the normal way. And the youngest is Austin. O-S-T-E-N. Kira Kaz. Explain yourself. What is this? I'm not even five minutes into talking about this. My freaking SD card ran in this space. Now I'm looking at my camera. Apparently it's at half battery even though I charged it overnight. The universe does not want me to talk about this because the universe cares about my sanity. I'm already over this. Anyway, Max and America have four kids. Austin, Caden, Erin, and Edlin. Erin and Edlin are twins. The drama is Edlin is seven minutes older than Erin and because Maxon and America are hashtag feminists, they're like, the firstborn child is going to be the queen, not the firstborn son. This is good. So Edlin is the heir and she's mad about it. She said, equal rights? No, thank you. An important bit of context for these books, the first one was published in 2015, the second one was published in 2016, the Hillary Clinton Identification of Edelyn Shreve, it cannot be overstated. She is showing up places in pantsuits. She is a girl boss. It is so much for me emotionally. Edlyn is going to be the queen. Page one. Alas, mom and dad couldn't stand to watch their firstborn be stripped of a title by an unfortunate but rather lovely set of breasts. I deserve financial compensation for having to read that. If I have to suffer, you have to suffer too. First page two. We didn't even like hide the crazy. It's just right up there. Edlyn is the worst. Like legitimately the most unlikable character I have ever read. I don't mind morally great main characters. I I don't mind when like you know the main character is kind of unlikable but then you like learn more about them as the book progresses or like even if they stay unlikable if it's written well I don't care like for example my year of rest and relaxation by Otessa Moshfak is an amazing book I greatly enjoyed it and the main character in that is an absolute nightmare but Edlin is the worst and yet somehow I feel like we're supposed to be rooting for her but I don't understand that because she is a nightmare just as made to my exact measure exotic desserts flown in simply because it was a Thursday and an endless supply of beautiful things were all perks. They were easily my favorite part of the job. Ilya is an extremely poor country. We have established this. There's also still a lot of political unrest. Lest we forget the rebels. They don't exist anymore. I will get into it in a second. Surely there are better things to be using your money than super fancy dresses and flying in desserts simply because it's a Thursday. Ignoring the fact that that is absolutely not even fiscally responsible. Think about the impact that that has on the environment. I hate her. There's no reason for this. And no, she does not get more likable. In fact, I think she gets worse as the books progress. A core tenet of her personality, she really likes fashion, but she does not like math. Math wasn't a skill that came to me naturally, so I had to work twice as long on any proposals for budget cuts or financial plans. I can't explain it. It just feels a bit misogynistic to have your main character be like the girl boss of all girl bosses. Oh, her brother's really good at math, effortlessly good at math. Of course, Aaron was naturally good at math, but he was never forced to sit through meetings about budgets, rezoning, or healthcare. He got off scot-free by seven stupid minutes because girls like fashion and girls are bad at math. I don't think that's as girl boss feminist as you think it is, babes. You made her up. You could have made her have any hobbies. You could have made her good at math. Or you could have not even mentioned it. As I mentioned earlier, the rebels no longer exist. Correct me if I'm wrong. The southern rebels, remember the ones who were killing people, their whole goal was to abolish the monarchy. The monarchy! 
hierarchy still very much exists, Edlin isn't winning anyone over with her winning personality. I think that the Southern Rebels would still exist. I guess they don't. There was also a monstrous safe room beneath all of that. I'd only been there twice that I remembered. Once during a drill when I was three, and once when the last string of rebels attacked us shortly after. It was strange to think about. The rebels were gone. Now we were faced with different pockets of people fighting the monarchy. Why are the rebels gone though? Because their goal was the end of the monarchy, and the monarchy still freaking exists. There's been no changes, so why would they stop attacking? Just to be clear, I am not pro killing people. I think there are more productive ways to get your point across than to just go in and murder a bunch of people. But like plot wise, it doesn't make sense to me. Maxin tried to eliminate the caste system. It's not going well. I feel like you should have some systems in place for this because now there's like post caste discrimination. One instance that we hear about early on in the book is that a waiter applied to be a cook at the restaurant that he worked at. The owner of the restaurant denied his application on the grounds that he used to be a lower caste. Someone burned the restaurant down. Arson is bad, but also so is discriminating against people. And if you're already in a country that is really fraught, I'm not surprised that stuff like this happens, but that's not Edlin's reaction. Edlin says, looking at the charred remains of the building, I honestly don't know whose side I was on. The owner had the right to promote or fire anyone he wanted, and the waiter had the right to not be seen as something that technically didn't exist anymore. That just feels icky. It's like when people are protesting for valid, valid things that you should be protesting for, and people are like, well, like, you, you're allowed to protest, but like, I don't get why you have to, like, break stuff. It's kind of part of it. Like, yeah, people are gonna die. It's just terrible, but like, inevitable? Don't discriminate against people and maybe your restaurant would get burned down. Just saying, I know whose side I am on and it's not very hard. No one in this goddamn government is equipped to run a country instead of, I don't know, fixing the issues, setting up systems to support the citizens of their country, Maxon decides what better way to distract the country than to hold another selection. And Edlin is like, absolutely not. I glared at her. You promised, you promised you'd never force me into marrying someone for an alliance. How is this any better? I get her frustration, honestly. She is so anti-marriage. She's like, I can do it all myself. But like, I get it. I too am a person who does not want to get married and who does not love the idea of marriage. I support women's rights. I also support women's wrongs. And in this moment, I do support Edelyn being mad. But she's also the princess. You have to get married because you also have to produce an heir. So she has to get married eventually. I guess now is as good as time as any to like get married. America and Max are like, just think about it. Edlin goes to her twin brother, Aaron, A-H-R-E-N. Let's not forget how it's spelled. Sorry to any Edlins or Aarons in the world, but your names are stupid. Not if you're Aaron and it's spelled in a normal way. I know plenty of Aarons spelled E-R-I-N and A-A-R-O-N, but if it's spelled A-H-R-E-N, you're wrong. And I think you know that. So Edlin goes to Aaron's room and she's like, I don't want to do this. And Aaron's like, the people of Ilya hate you. You should do this. Maybe it will win over their trust. Maybe it's like as long as you give it the old college try, you don't have to get married at that. So she runs back to tell her parents what she's decided. As she's in the hallway, she runs into Kyle Woodwork. So remember Marley from the first three books? When America became queen, she officially pardoned Marley and her husband. And now they live in the palace. Marley has two kids, Kyle Woodwork and Josie. Edelyn hates everyone. And she hates Josie with the fire of a thousand suns she is a hater to her core and in that sense we are the same because i too am a hater so she hates josie she also fucking hates kyle unreasonably so i don't know who i was more embarrassed for him for looking so sloppy or my family for having to be seen with such a disaster she's so rude also kyle super normal name right no have you learned nothing we don't get normal names in this book it's kyle spelled k i l e Kile. That is so, so atrocious. So she runs into Kyle and then she finds her parents and she's like, listen guys, I will do the selection on three conditions. Condition number one, anyone who gets selected for the selection can leave at any time. I'm not keeping them here. I'm not forcing them to stay. Maxon's like, sounds super fair. Condition number two, Edlin is like, everyone has to get a background check before they come into my life because like creeps exist, right? Third condition, the selection will go on for three months 
And if at the end of these three months, I don't find anyone that I love, I don't have to get married. Maxon and America are kind of like, if we say yes to that, then you're not even gonna try. You're gonna phone it in for three months and then you're gonna end with no one getting married. And in Edlin's brain, she's like, yeah, obviously that's the whole point. I don't wanna get married. But outwardly, she's like, no, like I'll try my very hardest. I'll try to fall in love. Wink, that's me winking. Maxon and America are like, sure. But as long as you actually try then yes you can end it after three months if you don't find anyone so they agree to that and they start the select they're picking the names she gets to the person from angela's she picks it up and she opens it and it's kyle fucking woodwork and everyone's like kyle i didn't know you submitted your name for the selection and kyle's like i didn't edlin is like i don't like kyle i i, I hate kyle i don't want to date kyle but they're like well we already announced them so we can't like redraw so like kyle's part of this now sorry you don't have to pick him this selection is a big deal because it's the first women-led selection. It's the first selection with men as contestants. That's great, feminism. But, and not to get to LGBT on Beyonce's internet. Um, so 35 women in a competition, that's fun. That's cute and sassy and flirty. 35 men in one building competing? That, that's scary to me. I am not personally comfortable with that because men scare me and also st they're stinky. I have had male roommates before in my life and they don't smell great. So I just, I don't think this is as like cute and flirty as the lady selection is, you know? And also, also, a common criticism I see of the original selection series is like, out of 35 girls, at least a couple of them are gonna be queer, which yes, and my rebuttal to that is we don't meet all 35 girls in depth, so like who says they aren't? And also they wouldn't submit their names for the selection if they were queer, you know, I, I'm not personally hung up on that fact. The thing is, is out of 35 men, at least two of them are going to be creepy, but they did background checks, right? So everything's fine. I hope you know that every time I say the word boys, it's boys with a Z every time. And I'm not saying boys, I'm saying boys, the boys. Correct me if I'm wrong. If your country is poor and experiencing some civil unrest, the solution is not spending a bunch of money on like a little competition right? I, what do I know? So one day, America is tanning in the garden, and we get this lovely gem of inner monologue. I wish, as I had so many times before, that we had a pool. I was pretty good at getting my way, but dad never budged on the pool issue. When the palace was mine, that was going to be the first thing on the agenda. She's tanning in the pool, and Josie, remember Josie, Kyle's sister, the daughter of Marley and the, that guy? She comes up to Edlin and is like, oh my god, like, it's so exciting. I'm so excited to have all these guests in the castle. Like, are you excited for the selection? And Edlin is like, shut up, Josie, go die in a fucking hole. I hate you. She doesn't actually say that, but that is the energy because Edlin hates all women. So the guys come to the castle. She meets them all one by one. Here are the immediate standouts. Hale. The way he introduces himself, he says, Hi, Lady Edlin, Your Highness, or whatever. I'm very impressive because my father was a two. Edlin is like, I don't give a shit. And then he goes, I'm going to do one thing every day to prove myself worthy to you. Slay. Another standout, just from the first meetings, is Ian. Again, not spelled the normal way, spelled E-A-N. I'm sure people spell it like that. I don't like it. I personally believe that if you're going to be called Ian, you should spell it right. I-A-N. We immediately get bad vibes from Ian. He's kind of a loner. He's kind of quiet. He introduces himself with a dad joke, which is a little bit iconic. His caramel colored hair was brushed back and he walked with his hands in his pockets as if he'd strolled down these halls before. His demeanor actually threw me for a second. Was he here to meet me or was I here to meet him? Your majesty, he greeted silkily as he sank into a bow. Highness, I corrected him. No, no, it's just Ian. He cocked one cheek up into a smile. See, I get bad vibes from him, but like, you know, I could be convinced. The last standout from this initial meeting is a guy named Henry. Henry is from Swendway, and he does not speak a word of English. They have to communicate exclusively through a translator. The translator's name is Eric. He seems very nice. To introduce this selection to the public, they hold a parade. Now, one thing about me, I will pull up for a parade. If there's a parade going on, you bet your ass I'm there. I love parades. I love parades parades it's just so joyful I, I just love parades they're holding a parade it's all going fine and good and then Elin gets hit with an egg and people start throwing food at her and yelling they're like we need jobs like down with the monarchy something hit me that was clearly not a flower I looked to see runny egg dripping down my dress and onto my bare legs. After that, half a tomato hit me then something else I couldn't identify. I dropped down covering myself with my arms. We need jobs someone shrieked the cast still live.
they kind of have a point. Not gonna lie. What has their government been doing to support them? Literally nothing. Instead of actually helping the government hold a little, a little competition. Edlin is super embarrassed. I 1000% do not care. I don't feel bad for her because they're kind of right. Why would they do this to me? My people, my subjects, why would they do this to me? I don't care. All I feel is apathy. It's not even apathy, it's rage. I feel rage, I feel hate. I don't care. I don't feel bad for you. Shut the fuck up. Maxton goes, I felt so certain that the selection would lift their moods. I thought they would delight in this. Well, Aaron started. They might have if it wasn't Edlin. And he's so real for that. The girlies that get it, get it. The girlies that don't, don't. And Aaron gets it. And Edlin don't. So after this parade incident, Edlin is like, I need to make a statement. So she decides that she's going to do a, a little elimination. She walks right into like the men's room. That's not right. The, men, the men's parlor. She walks right into the men's parlor and she just like goes down the line and is like, you can go, you can go, you can go. She eliminates 12 people. As soon as this gets out to the tabloids, they're like, what the fuck is this? Some of the tabloids ask if she even likes men, if she's a lesbian, which this book would have been so, so much better if we had a little bit of Cecil Queer Rep in there. But we don't. Edlin is just a nightmare. Edlin is like, well, my dad eliminated eight people on his first day. Why is everyone getting mad when I do it? When my father is stern, no one chastises him. I don't think it's fair that when I act similarly, I'm seen as cruel. I'm making a huge decision and I'm trying to be wise about it. Allow me to compare and contrast for a second. Maxon pulled everyone aside individually, announced they were leaving privately. Also, he only eliminated eight people. He's likable. He's nice. People generally like him. Babe, it's not misogyny. It's because you're the fucking worst. It's not because your dad's a man. It's because you suck. Maybe do some soul searching. I don't know. It's a terrible day for Edlin lovers. I'm not sure who these alleged Edlin lovers are. If you exist out there, power to you. Things are going abysmally for Edlin. Everyone hates her. And the news is like, she fucking sucks. Is she a lesbian? We don't know. So Edlin is like, I have to do something about this. She goes to Kyle. She's like, Kyle, can we stage a kiss? We'll have cameras there. We'll pretend like it's the end of like a cutesy little night. At least this will put the rumors to rest that I don't, I'm not trying. Kyle Kyle's like, fucking sure, I guess, whatever, let's do it. So they go to Kyle's room before this kiss that it looks like it's the end of a date. Turns out Kyle really likes architecture and he loves designing buildings. And he's like showing his designs to Edlin and they're chatting. And Edlin is like, I couldn't believe it had taken me all these years to see this side of him. Behind the books and the snippy remarks, there was a curious, engaging, and sometimes very charming person. Are they starting to fall in love? So at the end of the evening, they have a little kiss. I leaned into Kyle, still holding him, and he brought up his free hand and cupped my cheek. He held my lips to his for what felt like forever before pulling back. Edlin is like, damn, like, he's kind of cute. He's kind of charming. And like, we just had a kiss and it was really good. Maybe, maybe he's not such a bad option. Now, let me get one thing straight right now. I am team Kyle. I do not think that Edlin deserves happiness, but how adorable would it be? Like, you know, they grew up together. They kind of hated each other and then they fall in love. I am proudly team Kyle. Argue with the wall, team Kyle is the way to be. So the next day, Edlin has a date with Hale. Remember the guy who said he was a two and he's like, I'm gonna do one thing every day to blah, blah, blah. Allegedly, Edlin really likes fashion, but let me read to you a description of the most atrocious outfit I have ever read. I put on a yellow dress that was longer in the back than in the front, which I paired with a navy belt so it looked a little bit less, I'm ready for a garden party and a little bit more, let's go out. A yellow dress that's like short in the front, long in the back, and a navy blue belt. That is a horrifying outfit. I'm not a fashion girly, but that is uggo. And I have to keep reminding myself, you know, it's 2015, it was a different time. But I'm fairly certain that that is hideous. So she has her date with Hale. They bond over fashion in the weirdest way possible. Hale goes, I mean, you dress like a princess, but then kind of not. I wouldn't be surprised if you were actually the ringleader for an all-girl mafia. She leaves the date really, really abruptly for no real reason. It's a little bit rude, actually. She just kind of walks away and Hale's like, what the fuck? I thought we were bonding. A few days later, they have a little garden party, after which there's going to be another elimination. Do you really think another elimination is the best idea? Girl, she is out for blood. She's taking no prisoners. She said, if I don't like you, you're gone. Whatever. Live your truth. At this party, her and Kyle have a little moment. She, like, insults his tie, but in, like, a cute way where she's like, that tie is the ugliest fucking thing I've ever seen. And he's like, okay. But, like, they're flirting. Remember Ian? He's the one with the bad vibes and the dad joke he comes up to her and he's like i think i could be of help 
to you. He's being super cryptic and she's like, what do you mean? And he's like, we'll talk about it later. After the party, Kyle comes by Edlin's room to drop off her tiara. It's a long story how he got her tiara. I don't actually give a single shit. I don't care, so I'm not gonna explain it to you. Edlin is like, Kyle Woodwork, do you wanna kiss me? And he goes, I wouldn't mind it. And then Edlin is like, and you understand that me kissing you doesn't mean that I actually like you and that I would never ever marry you. And he's like, yeah, I'm down. Are we setting up a little enemies to lovers situation happening? I do like that. They're kissing, they're making out. Kyle is like, how are you doing? I know this selection must be pretty stressful for you. She gets fucking mad. If I need advice, I talk to my parents. If I need a friendly ear, I have Aaron. You were helping me for a minute and then you had to start with the questions. He's being nice, you idiot. He's being kind, which is frankly more than you deserve because you are the worst. You ruined it with your questions. Fuck off. You don't deserve this. He can do so much better than you. Fuck you. I'm heated. I hate her. Yet another reason why Edlin is the worst. She is cruel to her personal maid. She has a maid whose name is Nina. Nina and her are like friends, except for like, you pay Nina, so are you really friends? Let's have a discussion about it. Like, it's not your friend, she is an employee of you. Let's have some boundaries there. One day, Nina is talking about her boyfriend, and she's like, yeah, he's a scientist. You know, we're long distance right now, but I'm super proud of him. And Edlin goes, it's simply intriguing to me the dynamic you must have. You have my laundry in your arms and he might cure a disease. Those are two incredibly different roles in the world. You bitch. That's not good. Nina obviously gets super offended and she's like, I'm not gonna be your maid forever. Cause like, why is she getting offended at me? Because you insulted her? This book is taking years off of my life. The next day, Evelyn goes on a date with a guy named Jack. Shocker, he's a creep. What did I say at the beginning? At least two of them are gonna be creeps. Yeah, let's keep that in our brains. So he like, you know, comes into her personal space, encroaches on some boundaries and just has like general really creepy vibes. Evelyn is like, he touched me, he touched me. Bad vibes are bad, trust your gut girl. So Aaron punched him and they obviously eliminate him and they're like oh whoo dodged a bullet on that one glad there's no more creeps in the castle thought you did a background check could this have been avoided if you had done a background check the first time potentially do we care oh no of course not why would we care after this incident, they decide that Edlin is never going to be alone with the boys, which again, I'm concerned that this wasn't already something that was in place. Should have been a rule beforehand, but okay. Here's the thing. If she is never alone with any of these men, God forbid she marries one of them and she's never been alone with him when she's finally alone with him because, you know, they're fucking married now and he turns out to be like an abusive asshole. A guy could be like, you know, saving face in front of guards and cameras and then the minute he's alone with her, he turns into like controlling manipulative freak. Yes, she's the princess and she has lots of resources and lots of people around her things still happen i feel fear for her safety after this edlin and ian go on a date together and ian is like i come to you with an offer you may not need it at all but i want to present the option to you all the same and edlin's like i'm intrigued what can you offer me i'm i'm literally going to be the queen i have everything i could ever want and he goes i would never hold you down i would never hold you back i wouldn't even ask you to love me if you chose me we can have a marriage free of conventional restraints make me your king and you will be free to reign however you see fit. He's like, let's do some ethical non-monogamy, which is so girl boss of him. And she's like, I'll think about it. They have a little group date. Ian is not involved. Some of the boys are like, let's cook something. Let's like make a meal together. Kyle, Henry, and his translator, Eric. Fox and a guy named Burke. They all pair off to make different meals. Henry and Eric, Burke and Fox, and Kyle and Elin end up together. They make chicken. Now, fun fact about me, you may not know this. I am so, so afraid of uncooked chicken. Like, you can cut it in half, show me. If I have it in my brain that it's not cooked, it's, I can't eat it. And I can't cook chicken. I don't like having raw chicken juices around my kitchen. They make their meals. The chicken is, you know, a little dry, which I would rather overcooked than undercooked any day, obviously. The dessert that Henry made is awesome because apparently Henry is like a chef. Burke and Fox make asparagus. Allegedly, the asparagus is disgusting. Here's the thing. I'm a terrible cook. I cannot cook for shit. And yet I'm fairly confident that I would be able to not fuck up asparagus. And then Burke hunches Fox and they get into a little fight in the kitchen. Chaos is ensuing. Eric, the translator, grabs Edlin and runs her back to her room to like get her to safety or whatever while the boys are duking it out downstairs he didn't touch me exactly except for the occasional brush against my back which made me realize he must have kept his hand there the whole time inches away from me just in case Edie is like damn he's kind of gorgeous and also you know kind and compassionate i'm so over this because again might i remind you i am team kyle any of this bullshit not good for me after the fight edlin sends burke home because he's the one who instigated she decides not to send fox home she has like a little heart to heart with him and it's really sweet and whatever the palace guards do background checks on everybody turns out both jake 
and Burke have prior incidents on the records. A female student from one of his classes filed a, an incident report against Jake for being creepy, and Burke has anger issues. Did we do an iota of research before inviting these strange men into your home? Clearly not. I mean, I do feel bad, but like, could have been avoided if people had taken the proper steps to ensure everyone's safety. Just saying. Why are we bringing rando men into your house without background checking them? Kyle and Edelin kiss some more. She like tries to take his clothes off. So turns out people are rallying against the monarchy. I think they are absolutely well within their rights to do so because clearly the monarchy is not working. You had your chance. Maybe let's reevaluate. I didn't know how things like this happened, but governments changed. Kingdoms rose and fell. Entire ideologies took over, shoving other ones to the side. Could I be brushed into the gutter? I shivered trying to imagine a life like that. Boo fucking who? You're a princess. Oh, sorry. The poor people who your government has done absolutely nothing to support deserve better. Yeah, and you're you're not the one to give it to them, girl. You are insufferable and you have no skills or rights to be leading a country. You just don't. I've been so stupid, I answered, shaking my head. I've grown up believing that I was adored, but the people don't love me. You hit the nail on the head with that one, Edelin. Maybe if you had been, you know, kinder, nicer, maybe they would like you. Mm, but you weren't. But you weren't. You were a nightmare, so now you have to live with the consequences of your own actions. It must be really hard for you. I'm so sorry. That evening, she can't sleep because she's thinking of like, oh, what if I get overthrown? So she decides to go down to the kitchens. Henry is there, and he's baking. Now, remember, Henry is from Swanway. He doesn't speak any English. So they're baking together. They kiss. That's all fine and good, but they don't speak a word of the same language. And at this point, Edlin has not made any attempt to learn. Henry is trying his best, but like, you know... English is a hard language to master. You would think she would know Finnish for like economic purposes. Don't royal people know like a bunch of languages? The next day, Eric, the translator, is like, listen, Bessie, I see that you and Henry are starting to have like some moments. And like, I love that for you guys, but I just need you to be aware that like, it will be years before you will be able to interact with each other. Years. Until then, you're going to be talking through a translator. Is that a sustainable relationship? And he's not like trying to talk her out of it. He's just trying to like be real Realistic. So Eric is like, you know, dude, like, it seems like you need a friend. I'm not competing in this selection. I can, you know, I can be an impartial friend. And Edelin is like, yeah, let's be friends. I'm immediately suspicious of this whole ordeal because we know how friends turn out in this book. It's a dark day for us Kyle stands. It's not going well for us. We are in the trenches right now because now Edelin and Eric are like having a bestie moment. A while later, we learn that Kyle, who uh, might I remind you, he wants to be an architect and he likes designing buildings. He has been designing low income housing. This is a net positive, don't get me wrong. These houses that he are is building, they are smaller than Edlin's bathroom. And speaking of bathrooms, he didn't put a bathroom in these homes. And his reasoning is most people use the facilities inside the plants. The reason that they use the bathrooms inside the plants is because they are unhoused people. You can't use a bathroom at your house if you don't have a house. So obviously they're using the one of the plants, but if they had a house with a bathroom, they would use the bathroom at their house, right? Am I crazy? No, I mean, yes, but not about this. It just feels like a little dehumanizing to be like, oh, they just need like a roof over their head. I believe that housing is a basic human right. And when it comes to housing unhoused people, yeah, we need to be like taking steps and, and being creative with our solutions. But for the love of God, they are people. And so they deserve like dignity, giving them a house and being like, oh, sorry, no bathroom. That's not very dignified. And another thing. This is made up. This is not real. So you could have included bathrooms. This didn't need to be a thing. You didn't need to be like, they don't need bathrooms. Like, why? For what reason? Either don't mention it or like add a bathroom. I'm unreasonably upset about this, but like, it just doesn't feel right. You know, it just feels icky in my soul. I'm sure there is a way to design these little houses in an affordable, cost-effective way and include a bathroom. And also, it's made up, so it doesn't have to be possible. Ugh, Jesus. Anyway, a couple days later, they have like a baseball game with some of the guys. Things are going well. And then Aaron runs away and elopes with Princess Camille of France. We all knew they were going to get married soon. Aaron wrote Edlin a letter. It's a brutally honest letter. It's honestly a little bit girl boss. And he's basically like, TBH, everyone hates you right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on that nobody's been telling you yet. More provinces are protesting the monarchy than you could guess. Not all of them, but plenty. And while it pains me to tell you this, the problem people have with the monarchy stems from one person you. I think that's like a little bit reductive. I'm sure that the reason people are protesting is not only because Edlin is literally the worst, but like that's definitely part of it. God, someone had to tell her. Someone had to tell her that she was universally hated and I'm glad Aaron did. Now, because Aaron left so suddenly, America has a fucking 
heart attack and goes into a coma. America's dad died of some heart condition. They mentioned it being like congenital or something. No, no, what's congenital? What does congenital mean? Is that sexually transmitted? Is that what congenital means? Anyway, she has a heart attack, not very slay. So with all of this going on, Edlin is like, either way, I couldn't slow down now. I knew that for my sake, for my family's sake, I had to finish my selection. And when I did, I'd have a ring on my finger. She's been super anti-marriage this entire book. I'm a feminist. I don't need men. Marriage, who needs her? Her mom almost dies and she's like, oh, time for marriage. The end of book one. I'm back. I'm caffeinated. I had a little snap. And then I spilled jam down my front, so just don't talk to me about it. Thank you. Book two, or five, depending on how you're counting. Yes, I did read this in one sitting. No, I do not want to talk about it. Thank you. America has just had a heart attack, and she's literally in a coma, babes. Literally in a coma. So things are absolutely terrible for the whole Shreve family. Because America is in a coma, Edelin has been given permission to whittle it all down to the elite. Edelin does a mass elimination, and she keeps only six girlies. She keeps Gunner. Ian, Hale, Fox, Henry, and Kyle, my king. Also, because Maxon refuses to leave America's comatose side, he has appointed Edelin Queen Regent while America is still recovering. So now she's basically queen, and she also has to date these six guys and also run a country. However, will she do it? As if all this wasn't enough, Remember how Aaron left to marry the Princess of France? Well, apparently this is enough to wage war on Edelin's first day as being queen. One of the guys is like, okay, girly, let's let's do war right now. And she's like, no. And he's like, no, we have to, because how are they going to take you seriously if you don't do war? And so she fires him. We also get a little bit of information into the mystery of Lady Bryce. I did not bring her up in the first book because I did not give a shit, but she is the only woman on Maxon's cabinet, I guess. I don't know how monarchies work. Edlin does not like her. She's basically like antithetical to everything that Edlin believes about herself. Edlin believes that the only way she'll be taken seriously is if she's like stern and mean and she just has like girl boss her way through. And yet here Lady Bryce is being soft and feminine and kind and people still respect her. Edlin doesn't understand how like this is possible. But we learn at the beginning of the second book Lady Bryce has been in the palace for almost 20 years since Maxon was king. Edelin is like, how do I not know anything about this woman? Hopefully we find out more about her later. So remember Nina, the maid who Edelin has been an absolute nightmare to? Well, she promotes Nina to her lady-in-waiting. I have a couple questions. First of all, is there a wage increase? Is the wage increase proportional to the amount of hours she's working? Is she on an hourly wage? Is she on a salary? If she's on a salary, is the salary proportional to the amount of hours she'll be working? Because I assume as a lady-in-waiting, she's going to be working quite a bit more right? What are her days off? Is there like a retirement plan? Is there a pension? Is, is this like a lifetime thing? Like are you locked in to be the lately in waiting for like the queen's entire reign or like do you get to quit? Like what are the vibes? Are there health benefits? Edelin does not seem like a good boss if we're being honest. It's like two days after America falls into a electrical coma, Madrid Ilia visits the castle. Another absolutely abysmal name. Madrid is the son of Georgia and August Ilia. Madrid sent a gift basket to America because she's in a coma and we learn a little bit more about like the falling out of Maxon in August. When August complained that the change wasn't happening fast enough, dad pulled rank and told him to respect the plan. When dad couldn't quite erase the stigma of being in a lower caste, August said he needed to get his spoiled ass out of the palace and onto the streets. Immediately, I am suspicious of Madrid. I don't like him. I don't trust him. What is he doing here? So she's like, what are you doing here? And he goes, you might be able to make some serious changes while you're in office. Like all the post-cast issues. Our parents can get it right, but maybe you could. I've spent years lending my ear to the public. I think I've heard them very clearly. And if my commentary would be useful, please let me know. Mm, feels weird. Feels a little strange. The next day, America is out of the coma. Kyle and Edlin have a little heart-to-heart. -heart. They're like... I'd do anything you ask me to, Edelin. I shook my head, but I can't ask. He squinted. Why not? Did I do something wrong? No, you idiot, I said, pulling away. Apparently, I huffed. It seems you did something right. I just can't kiss you like it's nothing, because it turns out you're not nothing. This is a win for us Kyle stands. This is a good day. This is a good day for us. And you know, we don't get good days like this quite often. It's rough out here for us. And she's like, I'm not in love with you, but like, I could be. And he's like, good, because I'm not in love with you either. It's way too soon, but like, I do really care for you. <laughs> They're in love. They are in love. I'm loving this journey that we're on right now, TBH. Reminder, America is awake from her coma. Madrid sends Edelin 
flowers. I know he's a plan, this stinky, dirty little rat man. He goes on the news and he's like, I regret falling out of touch with her and how beautiful and intelligent you grew up to be. Edlin and Lady Bryce are like, let's just sweep it under the rug. Like, we're not gonna address it. He's, you know, he can do whatever he wants. I don't give a shit. The next day, Gunner, he's unimportant, but he's like, can I kiss you just because we haven't had any dates yet and I want to see if we're even compatible. And so if we kiss and we're not compatible, then like, I'll just go home, no harm, no foul. Edlin is like, sure. So they kiss and they decide no longer compatible. So just like that, we're down to five boys. Just a brief interlude here to talk about yet another reason why Edlin is the fucking worst. She constantly, and I mean constantly, is like as a joke, I could have you hanged for that. Oh, I could, let me send you to the firing swap. It's not a joke like having people caned and also the death penalty, the fact that that is still around in the future, have we learned nothing? Let me just give you a couple examples. Even my most violent Claire did nothing to diminish her giddiness. Don't forget, I can call the firing squad at any moment. Why are you threatening to kill people? Like, it's not fun or quirky. It's actually, like, extremely concerning. Another example. So this is a little bit later on in the book. She's having a moment with Kyle, and they're talking about how, like, their first kiss was when they were six years old. I stood up and pushed him to the ground and swore to him that if he ever tried that again, I'd have him hanged. What four-year-old knows how to threaten someone's life, he teased. One who was raised to, I suppose. Why is she being raised to? to hang people at four years old. This is like actually concerning. I have serious concerns for the way the country is being run. I have serious concerns for the way that these children are being raised. This is not the America singer we know and love. She is so anti corporal punishment and the death penalty as she well should be. And yet here we are, Edlin fucking threatening people's lives. Like it's no big deal. Anyway, back to the present. So Gunnar goes home. Hale has been a day one. He's been a sweetie. Everybody loves him. Remember he does that thing where he's like, I'm I'm gonna do one thing every day to prove to you that like I'm worthy of you. One day they're on a date. Hale randomly gets super weird. He's like, where do I stand? And she's like, I don't know, like I, you're kind of near the top. And he goes, that's kind of amazing, but also scary. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with winning this. I guess I never really stopped to think about that. But with you in charge these days, it's a little overwhelming. That is a, a man with open and honest and healthy communication, right? Edelyn does not think so. She goes, you're not trying to back out, are you? Did I miss something? You've always been so enthusiastic to the point where I wondered about your sanity. What's with the sudden cold feet? I did not interpret what he was saying as him getting cold feet. He gets a little frustrated by that and he's like, I'm not, I'm just like, God, I'm just like trying to figure things out. And so he leaves and she's like, why is he clamming up on me? Why is he being so distant all of a sudden? And you know what? I'm just gonna have to take your word for it. Sure, if you're telling me he's being distant, then I believe you. Keep this in your brain it comes back later madrid little rat man he suggests to edlin he's like let's have a town hall we'll invite people from various socioeconomic backgrounds into the palace so they can voice their concerns again are we not having something like this already how are you adequately serving your people if you don't know what they want i'm just baffled that something like this doesn't already exist they do a town hall it starts getting kind of chaotic and edlin does not know how to handle these people because she has no skills in anything there's this one couple oh they're so it's so sad so they are formerly a lower caste i think they were fives or sixes they live in an unsafe neighborhood and they're like oh we wanted to move so that we could start a family like i just don't want to live here forever and they tried to move to a different neighborhood and the prices for them were like exorbitantly expensive they did some price gouging which is uh, i would assume illegal but apparently not edlin doesn't know what to do she's like standing there she's like I just, people are yelling at him. i'm confused madrid is like the princess is too gracious to remind you of who exactly she is but as her very dear friend i cannot allow you to speak to her this way princess edlin may not be your sovereign today but she is destined for the throne she earned it through a long line of tradition and sacrifice she has earned nothing of the sort my air mind you at the beginning by seven tiny minutes i beat my brother aaron into the world so that throne that ought have been his was mine it was all luck babes she earned nothing she is a princess madrid gets real anti-democratic for a little bit because edlin is like you know what maybe these people have a point maybe we should transition to a constitutional monarchy and have elected officials so it's a little bit more democratic and madrid is like that's impossible it's not worth the trouble what i thought democracy was a good thing chris i'm the silly one Things are going crazy. Edelin is clearly not prepared to be queen. And then Maxon decides to step down as king and appoint Edelin as queen permanently. So let's make some better choices, please. I'm begging you. This is super dramatic because everyone, and I mean everyone, hates Edelin. Nobody wants her to be queen. So this is big drama. People are going to start revolting. Hale, remember Hale, the one who's really into fashion? He comes out as gay. He is like, I'm sorry, I can't marry you. And Edlin is like, why? And he's like, well, I have feelings for someone else. And Edlin is like, oh my God, who? And he's like, 
Ian. When the cast had been in place, there was a law that every family fell into the cast of the husband. Because of that, there could only ever be one male head of the household. Same went for women. No married couple, no legitimate household. Some people lived together without bothering with marriage, calling their lovers roommates, but it was frowned on. Mom told me about a same-sex couple back in Carolina who had been shunned to the point where they were driven out of town. I'd never cared for that story. It sounded to me like way too many people had it hard when she was growing up. Why would anyone go out of their way to make someone's life any harder? Is this homophobic? Feels a little homophobic, but I can't tell. She's not making a clear stance either way, which is uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable by that. Regardless, same-sex couples tended to live in the shadows on the outskirts of society, and unfortunately, that was still the case today. Now we understand why Ian was like, I don't care if you're not in love with me. Like, if we get married, we can just, you know, do whatever we want. It makes sense. Now she's like, oh my god, well, Hale is in love with Ian. I'm gonna let them go, whatever. They can do their thing together. Queen has the most horrible reaction. What would the press say when they eventually learned that not one, but two of my suitors would rather be with each other than with me? I don't know how to say it, but that's really, really shitty of you to be like, but what will, what will this make me look like? It's gonna make me seem like that I can't even keep a man because they, they would rather be with each other than me. That's not how this works. Like even a little bit. I feel concerned that that was your first reaction. So now if we're keeping track, we're down to three, Kyle, Fox, and Henry. Let's just weigh our options real quick. Kyle, perfect in every way. We've got this adorable little story, like they started off as family friends and now they're in love. Fox, he's nothing. No offense to Fox, but he does not exist in my timeline. And then there's Henry, who cannot speak to you without a translator present, which is fine, but like for a relationship, I'm not sure if that's gonna work. The only good option here is Kyle. Fox, remember a nothing person. He declares his love for Edelyn. She's like, Ugh. That seemed like kind of forced. I'm gonna send him home. So she sends him home. We have two people left, Kyle and Henry. On the news that evening, Madrid Ilya was seen shopping for engagement rings. I hate to be the one to say this. I really, really do. Aren't they related? Are they not distant cousins? Like a couple generations back, but like close enough for it to be uncomfortable. No, Gregory Ilya, he had the three kids. The Ilya line is ascendant of the youngest son. The Shreve line is like the cousin of the Ilya line. So they are related and everyone's like, oh my God, Madrid is in love with Edelyn. Like they're gonna get married, we love him. I'm like, guys, are we all forgetting that they are related? They are related, albeit distantly, but still. I'm not comfortable with incest on any level. I'm gonna take a controversial stance right now and say I'm not comfortable with incest on any level. No incest in this household. Madrid comes in and is like, we should get married and like we will be super powerful and no one will ever be able to usurp the throne. Edelyn is like, I have a selection. Like I can't, it shouldn't even be a discussion. You guys are distant cousins and I'm not into that. Edelyn is going to have to propose to someone now. Remember, she only has two options. She decides she's going to propose to Kyle. Kyle is like, I'd marry you tonight. Between the two of us and our families, there's, there's no way uh, Madrid Ilya would survive. People have been pulling for us from the start. Marry me, Edlin. So this is exciting news for us. Kyle just proposed. This is the exact right ending. And then Edlin goes, I will confess, I came here just now to make that very proposal, but I can't. And then she's like, I can't take away your passion for architecture. If you're the prince, you're not going to be able to do this. And she banishes him. Kyle Woodwork, you are hereby banished from the palace for the term of one year. She banishes him to go pursue architecture. Because what? Why couldn't he do both? Why can't he be the prince and also an architect? Tell me this would not be the perfect ending. I'm gonna get on my Kyle soapbox for a second here. Number one, they have like a little haters to lovers thing going on, which I'm obsessed with. Number two, the entire book, they're having these like little moments. They're kind of in love. It's adorable. Number three, Edlin needs a partner who's like gonna be a little bit hands off. And if Kyle, who has passion for architecture, has this other thing, then like they can live their lives separately and also together. They're perfect for each other. It's literally the best outcome. I don't under, you, Kira Cass, you made this up. You could have let her do both. So anyway, she goes to propose to Henry, the one who she cannot talk to because she did not learn Swedish or whatever the fuck it's called. So this whole time, Edie is like kind of, I guess, falling in love with Eric, the translator. So before she proposes to Henry, she goes to Eric and she's like, hey, listen, dude, like I love you. And he's like, oh my God, I love you too. She's like, but I can't be with you because of the selection. And he's like, okay. Edlin proposes to Henry. He's like, yes. And they are gonna announce it on the report. And then Henry is like, listen, girly, I may not speak English, but like, I'm not stupid. You're in love with Eric. And so he takes off the ring that he gave her and is like, I can't 
I can't say yes to this. I can't be the prince. You need to be with Eric. On the report that evening, she is announcing her proposal and she's like, Eric, uh, I'm in love with you. Let me, let's get married. And he's like, okay. And then Edlin says, meeting these young men showed me a world beyond the walls that I enclosed myself within. It is only in these past few weeks that I've learned how little I knew about my own country. Really, girl, just in the past few weeks? Idiot. Fucking hate her. As such. I took a deep breath. I come before you to announce that Ilya will become a constitutional monarchy. Fucking finally. But also, is that just something you can just, like, announce? Like, I don't know how that works, but it feels like maybe there's a couple more hoops that she should have jumped through before announcing it. So she asks Lady Bryce to be the interim prime minister while they do an election. You're gonna lose your fucking mind about this. We are learned that Lady Bryce is Maxon's half-sister. The way my jaw was on the fucking floor. No illegitimate child of the royal family is allowed to survive. Just like in case someone comes up and usurps the throne. Edelyn goes, so did you kill her? No, I was enchanted with her from the moment I laid eyes on her. She was just a child. She had no idea who her father was. It wasn't her fault she'd been born half-royal. So I took her away from her mother, kept her near me, and have been protecting her ever since. The ethics of that, very dubious. I mean, I guess it's better than literally killing this child but like turns out lady bryce is edlin's half aunt or it's it's max's half sister so edlin proposes to eric announces that it's a constitutional monarchy and asks lady bryce to be the prime minister while they do an election and they all live happily ever after there is an epilogue i'm still confused by it it's a funny thing to be the product of a fairy tale romance it's another thing to think you might find one yourself you can read stories and watch movies and you can think you know how it's all supposed to unfold but the truth is love is as much fate as it is planning as much a beauty as it is a disaster. Finding a prince might mean kissing a lot of frogs or kicking a lot of frogs out of your house. Falling might mean running headfirst into something you always wanted or dipping your toes into something you've been scared of your whole life. Happily ever after could be waiting in a field a mile wide or a window as narrow as seven minutes. That's not an epilogue. That's just like a paragraph. The freaking end. Let me tell you. <clears throat> so I love the selection books. They are one of my favorite series, hands down. Like, they're terrible, but in the best way. These are terrible in the worst way. Uh, there's no redeeming qualities. I just think these were never going to work. Allow me to compare and contrast for a second. First of all, a lot of it is about politics. A lot of it is like Edelin being a terrible politician, which, not gonna lie, is a little boring. Second of all, it all takes place in the palace. Like, at least in the selection, you started in America's house, and then she came to the palace, and it was like a big upset to her routine, and and then she like left to go to the rebel headquarters at one point. Her dad died, so she went back home again. Like you aren't only in the palace for three books, but here you're just in the palace. They don't leave like literally at all except for the parade, which is maybe like two paragraphs. Edelyn is unlikable. She does not get less unlikable as the books go on. And honestly, I would have rather hear it from the perspectives of one of the selected guys. In the selection, you get the perspectives of the other girlies, albeit through America's point of view, but you you still hear their opinions, their personalities. You don't get that from here. You're just following Edelyn and she's the fucking worst. These should not have been written. They are not good. I think that they might have been a little bit of a cash grab. You know what? My cash has been grabbed, so it worked. Oh my god. I'm currently reading the Throne of Glass series. I'm not enjoying it, so stay tuned for that. Hopefully that's gonna be coming out soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye!